We'll be doing a webinar jointly every three months, and the intention is to really showcase great examples of interventions, innovations, and insights, case studies, and lessons that demonstrate how to better measure, evaluate, and improve program performance. And largely, we'll be getting our examples from interventions that are delivered through private health sector interventions or interventions that seek to leverage the private health sector in, in mixed health systems responses. You can find a calendar of webinars on the Handshop Health Systems Hub website, and the link is provided here. We are actually recording this entire webinar, so you don't need to write down any of the links. The recording will be made available to you at the conclusion of this event. For the, web, for the webinar technology to, to uh, be used best, please do use a set of headphones or amp up the volume on your actual laptop. Um, you will be getting all of your audio um, from your laptop connection, from your internet connection on your laptop. So make sure your volume settings are quite high. Um, we do encourage you, this is intended to be an interactive session, so we do encourage you to send messages and questions to the moderator, who I will introduce in just a moment. Um, so send them at any point. You can just type them into the chat box that should be viewable at the bottom left-hand corner of your ReadyTalk interface. Um, we won't answer them as soon as you type them in, but we will cue them in, and then we will address your questions during the Q&A period at the end of the webinar. If you're having any technical difficulties, also be sure to email us and let us know. Now I'd like to introduce you to the uh, moderator, Dominic Montague. I think he's known probably to most of you. He's, he's a prominent face in the social franchising community. But his expertise also extends well beyond social franchising. He actually started his career off in Vietnam, uh, five years in Vietnam as a researcher at Pop Council and as a country director for American Friends Service Committee. He's also done dissertation work and research work and te teaching work in uh, various countries in Asia and Africa, a real specialization and expertise in markets for help. So it's a pleasure to have him here to moderate. So Dominic, I'm just going to pass the mic off to you to kick off the session and set the context for the participants. Great. Well, thanks, Reka. And uh, it's, it's nice to be here. It's exciting to have these sessions um, beginning and that this should be the first topic is, I think, um, very appropriate. This is uh, an increasingly important issue in global health and global development and um, very much on the radar uh, around the world with the, the uh, setting of new global targets for development uh, just uh, this this year. So equity measurement um, has become increasingly, uh, I think, an issue that development partners and development agencies, both donors and implementers, um, have been thinking about really for about 15 years. And you can see I've put up uh, on the screen a small version of the map of uh, wealth of different countries that you, some of you might have seen from Hans Rosling's uh, famous presentation about five years ago. That, that distribution of countries around the world according to the per capita GDP, has that, that ended up being a really uh, important new uh, set of data available to development agencies really just in the, the recent past. Um, and it became very important both to be able to see the distribution between countries and since about 15 years ago, the distribution within countries. Um, in 2001, there was a very important paper by a couple of researchers at the World Bank named Pritchett and Filmer which showed how to use asset information to uh, produce very good distribution um, indexes of, of uh, beneficiaries of different programs. And since then, a number of new indicators, new ways of measuring individual wealth have come out. And so the data has gotten better and better. The tools to measure beneficiaries' wealth have gotten better. And the, the global attention and the new ways of measuring the wealth of individuals have combined in really just the last two or three years. And we can see this because Jim Kim, the president of the World Bank, said about a year ago that the World Bank was going to, from here on, prioritize serving uh, the needs of the lowest 
the, the least wealthy 40% of the populations in the countries where it works. And so this idea that you could measure the wealth of your beneficiaries and target your interventions to serve those most in need is a brand new thing. And so I think to be talking about uh, equity measurement today is, is terrific and that there are a number of programs that are actively working to do this is, um, is exciting and uh, we're going to learn a lot. So we have three presenters. Uh, we're going to have three 10-minute presentations, case studies uh, that we'll get, and then that will be followed by about 20 minutes or 25 minutes of Q&A. If you would like to pose a question to the presenters, you should see at the lower left-hand corner of your interface on the screen in front of you a chat box, and you can uh, type in your questions. We'll be collating them here in San Francisco and uh, moderating that discussion at the end. We're very fortunate to have uh, three experts in this particular field. Um, this is a, a special group of presenters. We have Matt Bockschel from Mary Stopes International, who is the uh, global lead on social franchising, health financing, and director of the partnership for the African Health Markets for Equity Initiative, which is working in three countries and uh, has worked in this field for over 15 years. We have Dr. Anis Kazi, who is the Senior Manager for Policy Advocacy and Research at HeartFile, which is a, a quite renowned Pakistan-based NGO and think tank. And uh, he's going to be talking about uh, some of the programs that they work on using uh, equity measurements. And we have James Wumenu, who is the Regional Research Advisor for West and Southern Africa for Mary Stopes International, and is the uh, specialist in research and monitoring and evaluation, and specifically a specialist in poverty assessment and targeting of programs. So um, three very strong presenters in this field, and uh, I think we'll go straight into the presentations They'll be about 10 minutes each, and please write us questions as they uh, occur to you, and we'll collate them and in, use those for the discussion at the end. So, Matt, I will turn it over to you at this point. Thanks. Thank you, Dominic. Um, welcome, everybody. I hope you can all hear me very well. It's, it's great to have this list of names up on the top left-hand side of my screen, and I'm seeing so many old friends there. I wish I had time to to talk to you all. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the Africa Health Markets for Equity Partnership. Uh, the, it's all in the title, really. Um, I'll give you a brief overview of uh, what AME is, what it's about. Um, I'll introduce some of the data that we are finding from our work, um, specifically focusing on the equity aspects. and. Um, then I'll, I'll talk a little bit about our response to that data and um, how we're how we're taking the uh, the program forward from. So this still lines up reasonably well, and the new technology um, is is a an overview of the Army partnership. There are five different partners. We work closely with ISC and our friends at PSI. Um, we have ICT support from the Grameen Foundation, uh, and we work with Farm Access. It's funded by DFID and Gates, uh, and it's a five-year program in three countries, Nigeria, Ghana, and Kenya. Um, but the overall model is that by intervening both on the supply side and the demand side of the health market, um, and down at the bottom there, ensuring that the policy and regulatory frameworks are aligned that we can create a virtuous circle that will drive and improve the function of health markets specifically for the poor. Within this, the key interventions on the supply side are linked to social franchising. We essentially use social franchising as our tool for improving the performance and organization of the private sector. Um, and Within that work, we look on a routine basis. Every year, we conduct a series of client exit interviews. These are tools that we use across all the channels 
through which we deliver services. And we apply them to social franchising to find out as much as we can about the clients we're reaching through our franchised providers. One of the key we ask circled on this slide which represents the overall client exit interview methodology is poverty um, and looking at how wealthy are the clients who come into our franchises. Our initial evaluation is based on a PPI index so we're looking at absolute uh, income levels um, with cutoffs at $1.25 and $2.50 a day. For the purposes of ARME, um, we have revised the methodology and the analysis a little bit to uh, allocate our clients into quintiles. So looking particularly the bottom percent and the bottom 40% of the population. So to give uh, a relative measure of poverty as opposed to an absolute measure of poverty. When we look at the results that are coming back, um, these, are the, these are data from last year's survey. We've just brought in data from uh, 2014, uh, um, which is not a whole lot different from this. We look at quintile analysis from the five networks, social franchise networks, across the three countries within ARMY. Um, and there is one very clear message coming out of this, which is that social franchising in our countries, in our networks, is not reaching the poorest quintiles of the population. When we first saw this, we were, we were quite shocked by the data. Uh, it, it, it looks very bad to find that a significant portion, the majority of the clients we're reaching, in fact, are coming from the rich richest end, certainly the top half of uh, the population. So our first reaction to this was, this can't be right. It looks wrong. So we asked two sets of questions to try and evaluate whether this was reasonable um, and then to look at what was going on. So the first question we asked was, okay, are we, are we looking, we're looking at national level uh, income data. We're comparing our social franchises with the national level income data. Maybe that's not an appropriate comparison. Maybe because of the nature of social franchising, because we're looking at private providers who tend to cluster in urban or peri-urban settings where there is a sufficient market for their services, um, maybe it's an unfair comparison. So here as an example, we looked at the two programs. Uh, program in Kenya, the Amua franchise, and Population Services International, PSK's program, uh, they're, they're tons of franchise. And we slice them up in slightly different ways. So for Amua, this is the top, we compared the background data against which we were matching our clients with, uh, with wealth data from only the regions in which we were working. And you can see the set of figures on the right there from Nairobi, Coast, Nyanza, and Western regions shows a rather more balanced mix. In other words, in the regions in which we work, we're not doing as badly as if we had national level data. Or put another way, because we don't franchise in the very poorest regions of Kenya, it looks better if we exclude those regions from our data. With PSK, we had a, a slightly different uh, challenge uh, in the way that we could analyze this data. So we weren't able to, uh, to break it up by region, but we were able to look at uh, rural urban mix or to look specifically at comparing our clients, the clients coming to the social franchises, with the wealth data of the urban population. And here you can see a, a more significant difference. In fact, we're getting to a situation where we're about on track. We are reaching, well, I say we're on track. We're not reaching the poor um, with equity. We're not doing better at reaching the poor, but we are at least spread fairly evenly across wealth quintiles. So 
we, in, in a sense, there's two ways of looking at it. The one is that it's not in fair to look at poverty against national delivering services through a channel that is clustered around urban areas. The other question that, that it immediately raises is, are we franchising the right in the right places if we want to reach poor people? The second question is, are we comparing it with the right set of data? And to be honest, we don't really know. We are looking at that those data are compared with 2008 DHS data for Kenya. 2008 is a long time ago in a country that's growing at between 5%, 10% GDP per year since 2008. So we are looking forward to finding out the, the data should be released for DHS 2014 in a couple of weeks. The preliminary data is out. Um, when we compare with current data, we might expect to see that we're doing a little better or we're not doing as badly as we thought we were doing. We're also not comparing with anything except for the, um, the national level or for the, for the wealth data coming from a CHS. So perhaps it would be useful to compare between types of providers, and we expect to be able to do this in our 2015 survey to see if lower level providers are generally, as we might expect, reaching more poor people than larger, more sophisticated, either within the franchise network or potentially looking outside the franchise network. And we will try, although it may be challenging, we will try to get comparable data from exit interviews in the public sector and see whether we can do this and show conclusively whether the, the mix of clients in a local area going to public sector services are different, is different from the clients going to our private sector franchise services. So we asked those two questions, but the underlying learning from this is we're probably not doing as well as we have hoped in terms of reaching the poor through social franchising. Um, and there are a number of lessons coming out of this which are influencing the way we, we go forward with social franchising, certainly in Mary Stopes and to an extent in our partners at SFH in Nigeria and PSK in Kenya, and in the franchising community more broadly. What we've done at Mary Stopes is we've re reviewed our strategy. We have new guidelines coming out in 2015. Uh, and on our new strategy, we will be making making the explicit compromise of targeting providers we think are more likely to reach the poor. We will be trying to go to the right places. We'll be trying to reach lower level providers. Uh, we'll be looking to go small and go local. We do believe that that will, that will improve access for the poor. We also believe that by working primarily with those providers, we will offer a stronger value proposition. They will get more out of it. And we, we have emerging evidence that suggests that working has a bigger impact on their business viability. But we recognize that if we look at pure numbers, uh, the number of clients reached, the number of services delivered, this may not be the most efficient approach. So we have to balance that and make that compromise explicit. And we have to be concerned about whether we can link to national health insurance and other demand side financing mechanisms as effectively once we make this compromise and go to smaller local lower level providers. Which brings to the next question. It seems that from looking at evidence from our experience that if we want poor people to come into these private sectors sector providers, it is very likely we will have to find a way to link to demand side financing, DSF, to find a way to get the incentives in the right place. And for ARME, that means linking to national health insurance agencies. NHIs have historically been biased towards big providers for, for many reasons that we can discuss, but we are seeing a change under UHC more towards smaller providers, and more focus on primary health care services. Um, in order to facilitate those links, we as franchising organizations need to provide what they, the National Health Insurance Agency, wants to buy. 
which is tricky. It means probably expanding the scope, the range of services franchised, um, and tailoring service packages, particularly under capitation schemes, tailoring franchise packages towards what can be empaneled, what can be contracted into national health insurance. It also means working with those agencies to get the right tools in place so that they can effectively contract providers. Often the tools they use to select providers or to empanel providers are biased against small providers. And it means clearly picking your battles as well. In many cases, well, in every case within Army certainly, there are very different issues in the different countries about making this link. But if we get it right, we can move into this kind of situation, a new role for social franchising organizations where a primary function on the supply side of our organization is to build a bridge between small private providers and national health insurance agencies, third party payers. And if we do that, we believe we will improve the value proposition, we'll improve their business, we will improve their status, and we will also encourage them by providing more services to the poor people who are supported financially by NHIs. If we can get that leverage right, we can more effectively improve the quality and the organization of those services. From the NHI, we help them expand cover and enroll the poor who are often reluctant to join NHI if they don't feel the services are available where they need them. They can improve equity, access, and to an extent sustainability and drive demand tools. If we get that right, we improve the business viability of the franchise itself because we're supplying value to both sides of the equation and we can leverage that value for additional income. So I need to wrap up there. I've gone a couple of seconds over time. Let me just thank the partner organizations here, Diffid and Gates, on the funding side, PSI, Farm Access, IFC, SFH, and of course my own organization, Mary Stopes, for allowing me to put this together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matt. That was terrific. It was, uh, I, I think it was a great illustration of uh, finding data that was surprising, being first to thinking that perhaps the data is wrong, and then thinking, how do we react to this new data? So you, you made me think of the John Maynard Keyes quote when he was challenged for flip-flopping, and he said, when the facts change, I change my mind. And uh, so I think realizing that maybe something has to be done differently and uh, thinking through what to do that is, uh, this is, this is one of the things that comes out of having better equity tools. And so with that in mind, uh, let's go on to the next presentation, Dr. Anis Kazi who is, as I said before, uh, a, an expert in health sector reform and universal health coverage, and is going to um, speak to an example where equity measurements have been used uh, specifically for targeting uh, service support to the poor. Anit. Thank you for the introduction. It's such a delight to, to be at this forum. It's, it's a wonderful opportunity for, for like-minded professionals to exchange notes and, and learn lessons from each other. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, heartfelt financing. It's, it's a program I've been associated with. Uh, it's, it's one of the flagship programs uh, that Heartfile um, uh, Heartfile has developed and is implementing in Pakistan. Um, and it's an health uh, powered social protection system which, which prevents poor patients uh, who run the risk of spending catastrophically on health. Um, so it is essentially uh, preventing medical empowerment uh, amongst the poorest strata of society in Pakistan. So uh, I'm going to start with uh, health in Pakistan, a, a new opportunity. And we got to have this presentation uh, in a way because uh, I, I thought it will be nice to contextualize things, uh, to, to say a few words about the health systems in Pakistan. Um, and from, uh, from the health systems point of view, uh, then we transcend into the need of the program and how uh, equity 
measurement is being conducted by by hard fire so uh so the site is is a bit congested but but essentially what it says is on the left hand side of the panel there are different health systems which are operating in pakistan so we have many many health systems pakistan has a population of 200 million and some systems are vertical and cover populations through dedicated infrastructure so in terms of infrastructure there, there is separate service delivery there is separate governance arrangements there is separate financing arrangements um and and between uh, like together these health systems cover 44 million people uh which is around 22% of the population just for a reference this this is more than the population of the nordic countries which are thought of as being the bastion of social welfare but despite this we recognize that 78% of the population has to bear expenses out of pocket where where any major condition uh they would either liquidate their assets uh be indebted or for go health care all together so catastrophic health expenditures are the major barriers to achieving universal health coverage in pakistan and so the pie chart above shows different systems so there is armed forces uh there is a forge foundation system there are different systems which are operating um which cover the employees and some work their families for health care but essentially in between there is this that three tiered system of the government which was based on the nhs model which is supposed to cater for the rest of the 8 percent of the population and the slide below it shows out of all as this is the planning commission of pakistan's data that out of all the shocks a family faces in a year health shock constitutes 51% and this includes litigation this includes natural disasters uh so clearly uh, a huge problem so in terms of the next slide this is just to reemphasize the point that a mixed health system which many other countries besides pakistan has where the public sector and the private sector coexist to serve the population which are not covered for health so in terms of the public sector there is inadequate funding and there are issues of absenteeism of of inability to maintain uh, the supply chain uh of uh of inadequate equipment of lack of transparency in terms of hr structure and in terms of when we talk about the private sector the, the, uh, we we have seen issues and documented issues of dual uh, uh dual job job holding so there are health service providers which work for the government in the morning and they run their own clinics um in, in the evening and there is essentially unregulation of the private sector the, both of these things uh contribute to low quality of public services within the public sector and high costs of care within the private sector and both of these things undermine the equity and quality uh deliverables of a health system so the need for i'm just going to have a very brief overview of uh what hard file financing is and it's basically a third party a third party within public health term it just connects the the suppliers the medical suppliers to the patients um and the hospital and 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 the donor so hard file establishes the link between the supplier the hospital and the donors and in terms of two major things it does poverty assessment uh, eligibility ascertainment and donation donation management so uh, the main features in terms of our role is that people get quickly timely help when they need it and this is done in very targeted dignified 
manner without them having to line up, wait for months, and still end up getting discriminated against. So that doesn't happen. And the donors, which prefer to help certain patient groups, are facilitated. And we try to give unprecedented transparency to the donors. So the, the program comprises of a fund, uh, a partnership with donors, a uh, technology platform, uh, which, which is a customized ERP, Enterpri uh, Enterprise uh, Resource Planner System, um, uh, which, which is integrated uh, to GSM technology. Uh, so so mHealth is, is centric to the program. A system of uh, validating poverty, we, we, that is the crux of, of the presentation today, so how, how we measure poverty and, and how we triangulate data around, around patients. And the public-private partnership with public hospitals. Uh, so, and then the process which is characterized by transparency, traceability, segregation of responsibilities, clear accountability of actors, checks and balances, um, and having a risk-based monitoring system, I'll touch on to that. So in terms of the process, uh, just a brief overview of, of the process so that uh, when we later go on to, um, on to how poverty is measured and triangulated, uh, uh, things, can be, uh, things can be clarified. So in terms of uh, what the process is, uh, heart file works, heart file financing works in public sector hospitals. And the reason for working in public sector hospitals is, uh, that, is that the only expenditure uh, that incurs on the poor patients uh, is the cost of medical supplies. They don't have to pay doctors' fee because the doctors are paid by the government, and the bed per night their stay is subsidized by the government. So the main expenditure being medical supplies and, of course, food and travel uh, as people travel from uh, far-flung areas. So uh, when a patient uh, is unable to pay for their operations within public sector hospitals, the doctors there send a request to heart file uh, via um, their cell phones, or they can even log in. Uh, and send a request to us. This is uh, the, the message gets incorporated within Heart Files main system inbox, which is a request inbox, and uh, automated messages uh, communication loop is triggered. So a poverty assessment uh, message is, is received by a socioeconomic verifier, which goes and conducts a poverty assessment uh, on the bedside of the patient. We convey the decision within 72 hours. Um, our recent assessment is over the last five years. Uh, the, the time is within 56 hours. So uh, we are dealing with elective cases, uh, one-time high-cost cases. Um, we're not doing emergencies uh, at the moment. Um, so the decision is conveyed to, to the patient, the doctor, and the medical supplier. The medical supplier delivers the items in uh, the, the OT, the operation theater, and the procedure is done at the hospital. Patient is discharged free of cost, and the vendors, the medical suppliers, then bill hard file for the expenses. Hard file does verifications and uh, completes the payment. So this is a small cycle of, of what happens uh, in terms of communication, in terms of different actors being involved. Then, in terms of poverty equity measurement, poverty assessment, and this holds key uh, to, to what we do and who we target. So the requesting doctor, and just elaborating on the process that I just touched upon right now, uh, in, in, terms of, in terms of the process, the requesting doctor sends an indicative poverty score while sending the SMS, sending the message. So on the scale of 1 to 10. So if 10 being the poorest and 1 being on that relative scale of, and this is completely subjective. Sorry, Anis, and then we can, one more minute, please. Yeah, sure. I, so I finally... 
So, so then the socioeconomic verifier administers an asset and income questionnaire on the bedside of the patient. The central verifier, based on uh, the hard file headquarters, connects on site with the on site socioeconomic verifier, which is on uh, on picture number three. And then what happens is Hartfile has established, has been the first NGO in Pakistan, uh, which established a link with the government of Pakistan and tapping into their poverty database. So once we send the social security number, the national ID card number, within 15 minutes we receive data against proxy indicators of poverty that the government of Pakistan and the World Bank developed. And then there's a patient assessment meeting. Uh, where all of this, where the case is, is presented and all of this data is triangulated and a score is developed uh, and, and a decision is conveyed uh, to, uh, to, to the patient whether the assessment is, uh, whether the, uh, the operation is being supported by hard file or not. In terms of uh, the usage of such data, uh, so it has both, we have developed a reporting application where different reports can be generated for both internal and external use. Doctors have their own web page where they can log in and see the details of patients whom they have sent requests for. And the donors have a secure web page where they can track their donations and receive micro transaction details of their transaction uh, as, um, uh, as their donation is being utilized. So, this, uh, so in terms of collection of data, Heartfile uh, customized DRP collects, updates, and disseminates data on a runtime basis. Um, it has both internal and external usage for operational decisions, for determining uh, financial ceiling, for, um, uh, for fundraising, um, and uh, in terms of external use for all the actors, including donors, healthcare professionals, medical suppliers. Uh, one limitation is that within 72 hours, we are unable to do an on-site. We, uh, we can't go uh, to, to the household and verify things, but we triangulate and try to develop a, a, a realistic assessment. This is the last slide. This heart file health financing um, has won the Rockefeller Innovation Award and the Clinton Global Initiative Award. It, uh, it is uh, featured in the M Health Compendium of USA. We are currently working in 10 hospitals in six cities. We have 22 wards enrolled. Uh, around 5,000 patients have been helped. Our, our average cost is uh, 40,000 rupees, uh, which is $400 uh, per, per patient. Um, and we are currently conducting uh, several process and outcome analysis under my team, and I'll be soon sharing my experience with all of you. Thank you. That's terrific. Anis, thank you so much. It's, uh, it's great to get an example of uh, equity measures used in, in practice. And uh, I think we'll move straight on to, uh, to James. And James uh, Wumenu, again, an expert in monitoring and evaluation with Mary Stopes International. And uh, we're going to get from you some experience with MSI in Madagascar. And just uh, one caution I'm going to interrupt you. Uh, when we get too close to time, because we've got a number of questions to get to afterwards. James, please. Hi, everybody. Hi. Good. So as the moderator introduced, I'm going to present on a case study from Maristos, Madagascar. Um, and for those who care to know a little more of Maristos, um, we are a family planning and sexual reproductive health organization. And we provide mainly family planning and other sexual reproductive health services um, to clients um, across the globe. And we are in over 35 countries, including Madagascar, whose case study I'll be presenting. Um, now, this case study um, is about our social franchise channel. Um, and it was a special project which was aimed at um, providing access to um, family planning services, specifically to the poor, um, through our social franchise channel. Um, and to be able to help target the poor, um, we introduced a free voucher scheme, um, which means that before the client is given the voucher, um, to be able to target that, we introduce a poverty scorecard, which the, client, the potential client is supposed to um, complete for us to assess whether he or she is eligible for the vouchers or not. And the target for the project was actually to ensure that at the end of the project, 
um, 90 percent of the clients that will be able to reach will be poor. Um, so this poverty targeting scorecard was then going to help us to identify from the field before giving the voucher whether the client is poor or not. Um, so the project was supposed to last from 2011 to 2012. So what we did was midway through the project, that was at the end of 2011, we decided to evaluate our effectiveness in targeting the poor by conducting an exit interview of the client that presented their voucher for free services. And we did a similar assessment at the end of the project in 2012 as well. Um, so in the next slide, I'm going to briefly explain our poverty targeting tool and what we use eventually to measure the effectiveness of our targeting strategy. Now, the tool we use, the equity measurement tool, um, is known as a multidimensional poverty index. Um, and this is a simple tool with 10 indicators, and they are non-income indicators. And so these indicators actually cover three main dimensions. It looks like, uh, it looks like um, education, um, health, and then standard of living. So we have a set of questions covering education, like the, how many people within the family have completed five years of education, how many children um, below five years are attending primary education, or something like that. Um, under health, we have questions under child mortality, nutrition, and then a, a, a set of questions under standard of living, including um, the floor of your house, your, your water source, the fuel you use for cooking, and a couple of questions on asset ownership. Um, so these 10 indicators have some scores that come with them. So at the end of the administration of the questionnaire, we will kind of aggregate all the scores. And then one is considered to be poor multidimensionally if she is deprived on at least one third of the 10 indicators that we have. So depending on how you responded to these questions, which are yes or no, um, and yes for, for being deprived and no for not being deprived, you are going to be scored. And those aggregate scores, if, if, if it's less than one third of the total score that one is supposed to get, um, he is considered to be poor. So we actually did this for all the potential clients to kind of do the assessment of their poverty status before the vouchers was distributed to them. And in 2011, when we tried evaluating the effectiveness of a targeting tool, we collected the same equity scorecard data from 5,740 clients who access our services through the free voucher program in our uh, social franchise facilities. And in 2012, we did a similar survey involving 2,600 clients. Um, let me just share quickly some of the results we had in 2011 and the 2012 results and how those results were used. Um, so in 2011, when we did the evaluation midway through the project, we found that only 76% of the clients who assessed the, the family planning services through our free voucher scheme were actually poor. And actually, our target was to make sure we reach out to 90% of the clients who are poor. Um, so to have 76% meant that we had achieved below target. Um, but just to put things in perspective, um, even that 76% was equally high compared, if we compare that to the percentage of the national population who were considered to be poor multidimensionally. Um, we had a national data showing 67% uh, of the national population being poor. So for us to reach 76% through this free voucher program, and even though we couldn't hit the target, it was an indication that at least we've been a bit successful in, in reaching out to the poor. But what this midterm evaluation helped us was for us to then sit, step back and think through 
how can we effectively target the poor even with, with this current approach that we are using? Is there anything that needs to be improved? And what we came up with from, I mean, from the, the, the project team was that there was a need to retrain the, the distributors of the voucher to effectively, one, administer the, the poverty scorecard, um, which is given to the client to administer before they receive the voucher. And also, we emphasized on compulsory home visits to the client house so that we'll be able to ascertain the situation in the home, which will help us to know actually whether the client is poor or not. Because majority of the questions in the, the poverty targeting tool talks about the, the nature of the home, the walls, the, the, the cooking well used, the source of water and all of that. And we thought by home visit, most of those data could be verified uh, from the house. So we actually emphasized on, on that during the retraining section. And then, so at the end of the 2011, after the retraining, we did a second assessment in 2012, as I said, to kind of see whether the action point that we came up with actually helped in, in improving our targeting of the poor. And um, luckily for us, we, we had the situation having improved significantly. The 2012 results show that 85% of our clients were multidimensionally poor, um, which still couldn't hit the 90% target, but as you can see, we, we are closer to the 90% than we were in 2011. Um, one more so, minute, please. Okay. So in terms of um, how the poverty data is used, um, generally, as, as we can see, we have used it to help improve the targeting of the poor and also help us to assess how we are achieving this objective of targeting the poor. Um, beyond just using the tool to target, um, measuring the poverty sector of our clients is a common practice in MSI. Um, and we have an exit interview which is done annually across all our programs for clients who have assessed our services. So we are able to measure as part of our exit interview the poverty sector of our clients. And this feeds into um, a, a metric that we have called the high impact CYP. And one of those indicators, which is um, the, the percentage of the clients that are poor. So if you're able to reach more poor clients uh, in MSI, we, are, we consider it to be reaching one of the high impact groups um, because we feel by reaching out to these people, um, you are able to uh, increase the impact of family planning on these people. Um, just quickly to give you some brief um, lessons learned from the targeting. Um, of the poor. I think one thing we identified was a key strategy for targeting the poor was to do geographic targeting. And that is to choose areas where we have densely populated people who are poor. Um, but then with our social franchise channel, which is usually mostly based in urban and peri-urban centers, and it being a private uh, facility, we couldn't really use the geographic targeting to reach out to the poor. And that really informed us to then use the poverty scorecard, um, which then helps us to identify the poor and also to be able to target them effectively um, to provide those services to them. So I think that the key lesson here is where it is very difficult to use the geographic targeting, like we do for our clinical outreach programs in MSI, we, we focus that project mainly in rural areas where we know most of them are poor, and so we don't even use any poverty scorecard. But for the Blue Star, um, which is our social franchise network, we then went a step further to use the poverty scorecard, which at the end helped us to target the poor more effectively in those areas. So those are the key lessons that we have learned um, from targeting the poor. Um, and then this year, we are MSI Madagascar may switch to a different poverty measurement tool, which is the Progress Out of Poverty Index, 
that um, the first presenter did mention. Um, it's all because this is the global poverty tool for MSI, and um, Madagascar just had their PPI developed for them. Um, so they will be switching over from the NPI to the PPI. And this is a data that we collect annually to kind of know the poverty status of our clients. Um, yeah, so this is just a brief case study we, uh, I intend to share with you. Um, I'm still open for a lot of questions and discussions. Thank you for your audience. Thank you. Thanks very much, James. That was, uh, that was terrific. So we have, we have a number of questions uh, that have been asked and more coming in. Um, and so if you don't mind, we're supposed to end the webinar in seven minutes, um, and I'm going to ask the presenters to stay on for another 10 minutes after that. So we'll try and get to uh, some questions to each of you, and we'll certainly understand if uh, some of you who are listening and watching uh, uh, drop off uh, exactly seven minutes from now, but we will continue, as I say, for 10 minutes beyond that. Um, so we had comments for all of the presenters uh, thanking you for your transparency and uh, for the clarity of the presentations. Um, I think, uh, I think we, we had a few people who were saying uh, in particular how impressive it is to see um, an honest presentation of challenges and, uh, and shortcomings and a description of how those are going to be addressed. So uh, I'd like to, uh, to, to pass that on to all of you, uh, the three presenters, that uh, you, you have uh, people who are appreciative of the way that you're dealing with data out there. Um, one of the challenges that was mentioned uh, in a few questions was the issue James, that, that you just spoke about that uh, wealthy, that people in cities are almost inevitably going to be wealthier than rural populations. And um, so given that, why would you focus or, or what's the basis for focusing on urban-based programs ever and has the, uh, the new availability of wealth data made you consider a different geographical targeting uh, that you might move to? And since, James, I think you, you actually have answered that, maybe I can put this question uh, both to Matt and to Anis. So Matt, um, for you then, urban rural? Yeah, uh, it's, it's a great question. I mean, I, I think within, uh, within Mary Stokes, we have we have several different service delivery channels, and, and typically our, um, our methodology, our, our service delivery to rural clients is what we call outreach, um, where we essentially take a team, um, put them in a vehicle, send them out to generally a, a rural health center, an established facility, and then we, we do demand generation around that and provide services um, close to, to where those women live. And, and globally, 80% of our clients um, in that channel live on less than $2.50 a day. So um, w that, that is one way in which we, we reach out. I think from a, from a social franchising perspective, there are examples of programs that have explicitly looked at franchising providers further out, probably not as far out as we're going to get with outreach, but um, there, that's certainly the direction we're heading in. I think I'd probably highlight our Siraj program in, in Pakistan, which is franchising lower level providers um, and is also uses a lot of vouchers. It's a heavy voucher program. Um, specifically to improve the, the equity characteristics. The reason that Ame looks at a different financing mechanism is because we see the, the, the global discussion about health finance and um, bringing purchasing power to poor populations to, to access health services effectively. Globally, we see that being delivered through national health insurance mechanisms 
under UHC. And, and so what we're trying to do is how that can work. And we do a lot of policy work. We do a lot of, uh, put a lot of effort into trying to, trying to fit those two things together. So it's far from a complete solution at the moment. Uh, the principle of ARME is that as we start linking those more effectively, we will develop a model that can be used more broadly. Thanks. That makes sense. And um, Anif, I know you were you had some phone problems. Are you back with us? Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. So, can I can I pose the same question to you? Um, yours is primarily an urban-based program, as I understand it. And uh, how do you deal with uh, the issue that that much of poverty is outside of cities, and that uh, is is that something that you're working to address. And in addition, if I can just pick up on Matt's last point, uh, we had a couple of questions about the sustainability of voucher-supported programs and how do you move from that kind of targeting, which is from individual donors, to something which is more sustainable and part of a broader universal health coverage, um, global financing for the poor. So I don't know if you can address both of those things briefly, but uh, that would be great. Sure. Uh, so basically, hard file uh, health financing is for uh, to prevent catastrophic health expenditures um, uh, and prevent medical impoverishment. So uh, in terms of the rural and urban poverty levels, the, the hospitals, the tertiary care public sector hospitals have a catchment area of over 600 kilometers. Uh, we are working in, in four provinces at the moment. Um, so, including the frontier region, which has a, a Peshawar has a catchment area from Afghanistan, from uh, the tribal belt, uh, from the northern areas, uh, and Punjab, um, uh, the, the densely populated uh, province, which we we have a lot of catchment area uh, patients coming to tertiary care settings. Uh, and the reason uh, for, for, for that is that the referral system is broken within the health system. Uh, so uh, patients travel uh, many miles just to get small procedures done uh, because the core expertise, skill uh, are present in, in, in tertiary care settings and not in primary care uh, and secondary care levels within the system. Uh, so um, at, at this time, we uh, are catering for around 70% of rural population which come to tertiary care settings, and, and the rest of the population are from the urban poor strata. In terms of sustainability, uh, we have individual donors. We have, um, we have corporations which, which donate under uh, 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 CSR, Corporate uh, Social Responsibility. We have private foundations, uh, multilaterals, uh, uh, and bilaterals. So, so there's pooling of, uh, uh, so, so there, there, there are a variety of donors, and they have their own pref preferences uh, in terms of targeting children, um, uh, women uh, above a certain age group, below a certain age group. In terms of sustainability, we are uh, expanding into a health loans model. Uh, so basically targeting the middle class, whom for um, the cost itself is catastrophic, but they would be able to pay it over a certain uh, period of time. So we are, uh, we are uh, conceptualizing and, and thinking of partnership with a microfinance agency. Um, so to, in order to take this program uh, forward and um, target a different socioeconomic class. Um, so that would add to the financial sustainability. And there's a huge philanthropic uh, culture in Pakistan. So, so we are tapping into philanthropy because uh, all donors want uh, is, is transparency. Um, so, so by receiving microtransaction details, um, uh, it really helps our cause. And, and generally uh, generating a lot of interest uh, in Pakistan. That's, that's very inspiring. Um, thanks. Can, James, can I um, put the same question to you, the very last point on uh, the use of vouchers for uh, targeting subsidies to the poor and the questions that that raises about long-term sustainability uh, of, of the program? Is, is this a challenge? 
and how do you think that uh, that this will be addressed? Is there a future way forward? I think um, this is a really challenging aspect of the project. Um, and as you said, we can continue distributing free vouchers to clients forever. Um, if the donor money finishes, what, what then do we do? Um, so there has been some general thinking uh, within MSI for the sustainability, not only for our voucher programs, but for most of our projects that are donor funded. And one key area we are hoping um, to, to explore are one, um, in countries where there are um, national health insurance schemes, um, we need to show the benefit of this, the, 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 like the pilot project that we've done, to advocate for the national health insurance and covering those things. Um, in the case of Madagascar, they don't really have a national health insurance scheme, uh, but what the thinking around sustainability with this project was for us to use this pilot as a basis to advocate for government then to fund um, some of these projects because of its long-term benefits to the, to the client. Um, so I, I would say a sustainability project is to get government on board on this to fund um, some of these free vouchers uh, where possible. That, that, thank you. That, is, that makes a lot of sense. And, and actually, I think that uh, this idea of using uh, evidence about uh, health-seeking behavior and targeting of the poor as a basis for advocacy uh, was also mentioned by Anis and Matt. So um, I think uh, that's, that's another good example of, of how better data can be used for purposes that go beyond just targeting the poor. Um, can I can I bring it back then to the measurement issue and uh, to two specific questions that have come up in a number of the, uh, the the questions that have been sent in by mail? So the first is the me measures that are used. And um, uh, for those of you who have been listening, you'll you'll have figured out that there are actually uh, a number of widely used uh, measures of equity. There are the wealth quintiles, the dividing populations into 20% uh, increments that uh, Matt talked about with AMI. There's the progress out of poverty index, which uh, Mary Stopes uses in many countries, the multidimensional poverty index used in Madagascar. And in many countries, such as in Pakistan, I believe there is a national poverty register, which, uh, which is used by Hartpile, although, Anis, you'll have to confirm that that's, that is the measure you're using. Um, before that, I guess my, my question to all three of you would be, why, why one measure versus another? And what do you do about uh, interviewing beneficiaries who know that or may know that they're being interviewed for possible subsidies? And do you have concerns that you're getting uh, answers that are not completely accurate because uh, people are trying to assure that they'll meet your criteria for subsidy inclusion. And um, maybe I can put that first to Matt and then, uh, then to Anis and then to James. Uh, it sounds like a very big and complex question, Dominic. Um, I, I'm, I'm certainly not the right person to answer, you know, to, to have an opinion about which is better than, than uh, which other in terms of methodologies for, for measuring uh, poverty or equity. Um, I, I can comment a little bit on the, on the challenges with our experience in the, in the program in Ghana where we work closely with NHIA. NHIA does have a mechanism for exempting uh, the poor, in, in inverted commas, the, the poor from uh, premium payments. So, so if you are poor enough, you should be um, able to get free health insurance through NHIA Ghana. Um, in practice, they have not been very effective. I think it's fair to say at en enrolling poor clients, uh, clients exempted on the on the basis of poverty. Um, and one of the, one of our activities in Ghana is very much about helping to improve systems for doing that. But the politics of how you do that, which tool you use, and even if you agree at all where the cutoff should 
are extremely complex um, and there are half a dozen different agencies who have a say in that in Ghana. Uh, the, the Ministry of, I'm going to get the ministry's name wrong, apologies Ghanaian colleagues, Ministry of Gender and Social Welfare I think has the ultimate decision. But it's been a very long and complex process to come up with a tool and an appropriate cutoff. Um, so I, I can only reflect on how difficult it is. Uh, I can also add that we are grappling as we try and improve uh, the effectiveness of enrollment of the poor into NHIA. We are grappling absolutely with the point you, you raise, Dominic, which is if you try and incentivize that, you, you open the door for all sorts of uh, rent-seeking behavior and inappropriate measurements, and it becomes very difficult control. If you don't incentivize it, it doesn't seem to happen very well. So establishing systems that, that really work uh, are undoubtedly complex. I, I think uh, that's a good summary. So Anis, can I, because I realize we're running low on time, can I put to you the specific question of um, do you worry about people giving responses to questions uh, that, uh, that might distort their real poverty in order to be eligible for the subsidies you offer? And how do you deal with that? So, um, can I, can I, I come in here? Yeah. question. And, and Sorry, I can, think it's... Uh, it's yeah. Sorry, can, can I... So uh, I Annie? Yeah. Answer yeah. that, yeah. So it's a very valid uh, question. I'll just uh, raise, raise some important um, issues. One is the context and context in which you are, you are working uh, and in terms of the program. Uh, so the dynamics of, of the operational dynamics of the program and because we have to convey decisions of uh, financial help within 72 hours, uh, there is a system of triangulating uh, uh, triangulating uh, information and making making a score and uh, so so the first is administering uh, an income and asset questionnaire um, and you're right in terms of you know patients uh, wanting to prove their poverty uh, but we are fortunate and unfortunate in a way fortunate in a way that uh, almost 95 percent of patients that we've dealt with um, uh, how we verified. Uh, were uh, really from the poorest of, of the poor. And unfortunate thing is that in Pakistan, 40% of the population uh, is, is below the poverty line. So, so while administering the income and asset questionnaire, which is validated uh, by the World Bank, we are conducting cross-verification phone calls to the relatives um, and, the, and friends just trying to validate whether the information given is partly correct or not. In terms of the poverty registry, there, uh, for, for a social protection program, uh, the Benazir Income Support Program, a World Bank rendered help to the government of Pakistan uh, and developed some proxy indicators uh, for, uh, and, and this includes uh, whether the, the, the person has a machine readable passport, whether they have a bank account, a foreign bank account, um, and uh, with it, a road and, and water, uh, they have water connection at, at their place. So, so by developing this linkages with uh, the government of Pakistan, we have secured that, that adds value just uh, against a patient. If we receive some data that vindicates and validates uh, this whole uh, poverty assessment. Uh, and in terms of all of this information coming to a patient assessment meeting, uh, the, the process is more democratic. The decision making is more dem democratic. So, uh, so operations with uh, for control purposes, the authorization is separate from the operations. Um, so, uh, so yeah, very valid concerns. And, and of course, we are cognizant of the fact uh, that um, we, we really need to keep on evaluating and seeing and tinkering on the margins how we can make this tool more robust. Thank you, and it's James, I, I do apologize. I think uh, I'm going to have to cut you off because uh, we're well over time, and um, so uh, we we need to uh, we need to wrap up. Um, we're putting on a last slide that shows you where to go for more information. I'd like to thank everybody who stayed with us for uh, these extra 10 minutes. It's it's been a, a really terrific series of presentations and questions. The very last question we got was given the cost of targeting the poor, that it's more expensive to reach poor people in rural areas 
or even to, uh, to validate the poverty of people in urban areas, how do you strike the, the, the balance between making that extra effort which costs more or serving easier to reach people at a more cost-effective method? And I think there's no uh, answer to that, but it's a good question to end on. So I'd like to thank the three presenters again for, for really ter terrific uh, summaries and terrific programs and for your transparency and willingness to share your experiences. And uh, thank everybody who has joined in for the last hour. This was a great kickoff to this webinar series, and uh, I hope that you'll stay with us and uh, join us for the next presentation in uh, a, another few weeks. Thank you very much. Uh, please follow up with these sites, and uh, to Matt, Ennis, and James, uh, our, our deep gratitude. Yeah, thanks, Thank you. Thanks again. This was, there was a lot of uh, there was a very rich uh, set of questions that were posed to the presenters. Sadly, we could only address a fraction of them. So we would encourage you actually to continue to stay engaged. We'll send you a follow-up email on how you can do that. There are question and answer chat platforms that we will make available to you. Um, and then lastly, there's a recording of this webinar which will be made available to you. Um, and the link uh, is here on this slide. So many thanks again, Dominic. Thank you very much also for moderating. Cheers all. Bye-bye. Thank you. Please stand by.